Welcome back to the 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Retrospective, the eighth part, which is also the final part of this grand retrospective. Now that we've gone over the entire show in depth, you might wonder what could possibly be left. Well, any Turtle fan worth their salt would tell you that the 2003 series didn't end at season 7. It instead went out with a bang, a made-for-TV movie, Turtles Forever. There really isn't that much history for me to go over this time. The year is 2009. The final episode of the show, Wedding Bells and Bites, aired on February 28th. 2009 was a significant year for the TMNT because this marked the 25th anniversary of the original TMNT comic published by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird in 1984. To celebrate, Playmates re-released their original 1988 TMNT figures for the first time and, of course, we got the big finale of the 2003 series, Turtles Forever, an ambitious film that sought out to bring two generations of TMNT together as the Turtles of the 2003 series would team up with the original cartoon Turtles from 1987. This aired on the CW4 Kids on November 21st of 2009. But beyond that, I don't have a speech on the history of this one ready, so I guess that spares you all from the 7 minute long intro that almost all of these videos have had. I can only tell you this. I caught Turtles Forever right as it aired. I don't remember the hype of this movie at all. I think I was just flipping channels one morning and stumbled upon this movie the day it came out. Fortuitous timing, I know. But it was certainly the coolest thing I had seen in a hot minute. I mean, this is how I came to learn of there being an original TMNT cartoon from the 80s, and the sheer depth of the Turtleverse in general. It was so epic that I caught every rerun of the movie that came in the coming years. As I said in the Season 6 video, I later got to rewatch the entire 03 series, and through this, I came to see Season 6, 7, and Turtles Forever in a much more negative light. The last two videos have shown that growing up and doing more research can add a lot more perspective towards the things you didn't care for, so obviously I'm willing to extend the same to Turtles Forever, which I never hated as much as the last two seasons anyway. I'll tell you this though, I rewatched this movie when I got the whole show on DVD in 2020, which allowed me to realize that it wasn't as bad as I thought, so that was never a concern going into this review. Now, what didn't I like about this movie? Well, it's a lot different than what you might think, but let's just start with the premise. Turtles Forever begins with the 1987 Turtles in the dimension of the 2003 series as they get captured by the Purple Dragons, their exploits being caught on the news as the 2003 Turtles set off to get to the bottom of it. And while we're in this part of the movie, I can't help but notice that the shot of the Purple Dragon HQ is at night, and then three minutes later the eight Turtles escape and it's broad daylight. Besides a goof like that, I think the animation of Turtles Forever is fantastic. For the 2000s characters, the basic designs from Back to the Sewer are still here, however with what I can only assume was a higher budget since this was a movie, characters like Master Splinter, Casey, and April have much more detailed shading than they did in Season 7. The Turtles have returned to having pure white eyes with their masks on, and the masks themselves have shading as well. One of the things I hated the most about the Season 6 art style was the lack of shading on the mask. It stood out like a sore thumb since the Turtles' faces still had shading. The action scenes in general are more fast-paced and pack more punch than they did in the last two seasons, which is also a plus. For the 87 Turtles, their characters and world have been faithfully recreated with a modern art style. This newer animation allows us to see them fight much more and do cooler things than we ever did in the original series. Past the first season, anyway. While keeping it in character with the old Turtles by having them fight mostly by using their environment. Anyway, once the Turtles regroup with Master Splinter, the 87 Turtles claim that what happened was that they were fighting with the Shredder like they always do, and their Donatello had the idea of blasting the Technodrome back to where it came from. But a sudden attack from the Foot Soldiers caused the Technodrome to be blasted to the 2003 dimension as the two teams set out to find the Technodrome and defeat Shredder and Krang. When 87 Shredder finds out that this dimension has its own version of the Turtles, perhaps it has its own Shredder as well. So he tries to find him. The 2003 Shredder is currently located on an ice asteroid in the far side of the galaxy as seen in Season 3's ending. But using the teleportation device in the Technodrome, the Utram Shredder is brought back, and with the help of Karai, he claims the Technodrome for himself and plans on using it to wipe out all the Ninja Turtles and rule an entire multiverse. Ever since Into the Spider-Verse came out in 2018, it seems like mainstream audiences are well adjusted to the idea of superhero multiverses, if Spider-Man No Way Home and the new Doctor Strange are anything to go by. Turtles Forever was probably the most mainstream multiverse movie in existence before 2018. And it seemed like it was going to stay that way. I think I'm just projecting my own thoughts onto the page right now, but once upon a time, it seemed like some kind of Crisis on Infinite Earths tier event taking place in the big screen was a pipe dream, but here we are. Reviewing Turtles Forever puts me in a difficult spot. Not because I don't like multiverse stories, in fact, No Way Home is easily one of my favorite MCU movies. Not something I thought a post-endgame movie could do. 
But because Turtles Forever places far more emphasis on being a meta-narrative than a straight-faced one. And if you're familiar with me, meta-narrative isn't really my thing. There are many things I'm going to criticize Turtles Forever for, but you have to ask, well, in a story that isn't trying to take itself too seriously, how seriously can you criticize it? I think this is largely a case-by-case -case kind of thing. After all, I glanced over the story in my review of Sonic Generations because it barely has a story. It was about novelty more than anything else. So let's look at Turtles Forever. This plot also places a lot of importance on the novelty of being what it is, a lighthearted story that sets out to celebrate the history of the TMNT, containing numerous references that fans of the entire brand will get. Like these two mutants in Shredder's army, they're meant to resemble Toka and Razar from TMNT 2, The Secret of the Ooze. This nose-tracking device that Bebop and Rocksteady use halfway through was from an actual episode of the classic series. That sort of thing. Given the nature of this retrospective, I'm going to choose to look at the story in a more straight-faced manner, since that's what we've been doing since part one. So I figured we'd start with the most criticized element of the film, and that would be the 87 Turtles. It's weird, because I think the 87 villains are great in this movie. As early as season two, the classic series made the dynamic between the Turtles and their villains, Shredder, Krang, alongside Bebop and Rocksteady, a comedic one. Shredder would come up with some goofy scheme and it would always fail and get roasted by Krang and then get pissed off. It was fun. I liked that. In Turtles Forever, I'd say this was done really well. It's instead the Turtles that draw a lot of heat from fans of the old show. Simply put, these are, for many reasons, not the characters you knew from the original show. Starting with reasons outside of the creative's control. The voice acting. The iconic voice cast from the classic series did not reprise their roles for the film, and this was because the original actors are LA Union actors, and so it would be too expensive for four kids, a studio in New York City, to hire them. This movie doesn't even use the iconic music from the first TMNT cartoon, and that was because Lionsgate owns the rights to the 1987 show's music, and so four kids would have to pay a licensing fee in order to use the music, which they also were not interested in doing. So you get this rather bootleg sounding music. Back to the acting, the portrayals vary in quality. For Shredder, Krang, Michelangelo, and Raphael, the voices are very similar. Not at the levels of a sound alike, but still, they approximate the originals much more than, say, Donatello and Leonardo. Leonardo being the worst example. Sorry, Master Splinter. We've got to give those goons a turtleizing. We got all kinds of special anti-technodrome gear back home for just such an occasion. It's not a matter of acting chops, it's just that it's not the same voices as the nostalgic turtles the film sets out to bring back, so it just feels lame. However, I think most people are understanding of this, at least. The thing that really draws venomous criticism is that the personalities of the 87 turtles are what really makes them unrecognizable from the characters in the original show. Each of the four turtles are portrayed as though they are the same character. An annoying, laughing, joking idiot with each one getting their own unique quirk, like Don being the smart one still, and Raph often breaking the fourth wall. Some people just can't handle change. Why do you keep doing that? Who are you talking to? There's no one there! But still, if you even watched two episodes of the original show, you'd see how out of place it is to watch 87 Leonardo and Donatello busting a gut over the dumbest lines from their brothers. Hey! We resemble that remark! <laughs> the 2003 series had never held the original show in supremely high regard. Every time the phrase cowabunga is uttered, Raph tells Mikey we don't say that anymore, or, or someone must remark that it sounds really dumb, alongside other mythology gags we've seen in the show up to this point. However, a look into this film's history reveals a different story. Completely out of the blue, one of the lead artists behind the series, Emilio Lopez, had commented on my Back to the Sewer video, so I decided to use this opportunity to contact him on Twitter, link in the description, and ask him some questions about the behind-the-scenes stuff on Turtles Forever. I had mentioned earlier that the look of the 87 Turtles was great, and this was not an accident. The art department put in a lot of work to make the look authentic to the classic series. The artists got, quote, random incomplete references from different episodes, so a lot of the characters were redrawn from screenshots we took of the OG show. We also looked to the fans to help complete the references for the characters and backgrounds. This is why there was a special thanks to the fans at the end. They literally provided us with scans from their personal collections." Unquote. I mentioned before that four kids didn't have the rights to use the music from the classic series, but through Mr. Lopez, I learned that they had to sign an agreement to even use the characters and things created by Fred Wolf, like Bebop, Rocksteady, and the Technodrome. They just weren't able to get things like the music, which sucks to hear. The crew behind the film did not have negative intentions when bringing back the classic Turtles. They just were met with forces outside of their control. Mr. Lopez even told me, in regards to the personalities of the 80s Turtles, quote, That is something that a lot of us in the team had issues with. 
When writing the script and the writers needed references for the old show, we told them to mainly refer to the pilot episodes. But when we got the script back, it was kind of unflattering to the original Turtles, which was hugely disappointing from a production side because we worked a lot on trying to make the 80s stuff look like the original show." Unquote. He then went on to give a theory about why it happened, one that lines up with what I had written in this script before talking with him. That the portrayal of the 87 Turtles has a lot to do with how Peter Laird feels about that version of the characters. Look, I get if you're Peter Laird and you co-created this comic series that was supposed to be serious and the cartoon show is nothing like it. Resentment is natural. I don't think Mr. Laird mandated this or anything, it's just that he was very instrumental in giving the okay on all the ideas this series would do. Anyway, resentment of the 87 Turtles is natural. However, if you're gonna do a special based around bringing the original Turtles back, then you gotta be faithful to what came before. Like it or not, the 87 Turtles were iconic. They propelled the brand to superstardom alongside the iconic character personalities we've come to know today. I think this version of the Turtles was due a little more respect than what they got here. Especially since these turtles being really annoying was used to build a half-hearted character arc where the 2000s turtles, Raph especially, learned to stop finding them so annoying, leading to an unearned moment where they all put their hands together only to immediately go back to the same jokes about them being annoying two seconds later. I have heard some 2000s kids say they don't care about this issue because they don't like the 80s show, or 80s kids have had enough nostalgic media pandered towards them, but my attitude is just that we have to be consistent here. If the 2003 Turtles came back in a new Turtles thing in the 2020s, and they were seen as try-hard edgelords, believe me, I would not be happy. So even if I didn't grow up with the original show, you gotta criticize this sort of thing. On the flip side, I believe that the 80s turtle show is a lot goofier than you'd think if you only watched the first season, resembling this infamous scene Was that a mutant banana? more and more as it went on. However, I certainly think the old show was self-aware, but they always made sure the characters within took the world they were in seriously, which is the biggest disconnect between the old turtles and these morons who can't take anything seriously ever. I don't think Peter Laird hates the original show. If he did, it would be like the next mutation, which doesn't even get shown in the turtles multiverse scene. He just probably thinks it's not the best representation of what Ninja Turtles was trying to be. Which leaves us with this awful rendition of the classic Turtles we have today. What I find interesting about the critics of this movie who had never seen this series before is that they're missing out on a whole layer of why this movie has issues because I don't think it's great storytelling for the 2003 Turtles either. If you look at Turtles Forever literally, then you have a plot that completely turns the entire show on its head. Circling back to what I said a few minutes ago, meta-narrative is not my thing. Here we have a plot that shatters the fourth wall into pieces. At first, the Utram Shredder wants to rule this dimension and maybe the 80s dimension, but he's so intrigued by the idea of dimensions that he asks the computer to show him the multiverse. This is when he comes to the realization that he's in a multiverse that revolves around Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Remember how I didn't like Season 5 introducing the idea that the show was destined to play out the way it did? This is like that, but even stupider. The Shredder more or less realizes that in every single dimension, he and other Shredders across the multiverse are destined to lose because every dimension has its own version of the Turtles that will stop him no matter what. The universe will find a way to make it happen. The multiverse begins at an origin point called Turtle Prime, aka the Mirage Comic Turtles dimension. Shredder plans to travel there and kill the Comic Turtles so that all Ninja Turtles are literally erased from existence. I will say it for the final time. One of my favorite things about this series is how much history and lore there was behind every aspect of it. It was a detailed show by the standards of the target demographic. However, making it a destiny plot in Season 5 reduced that effect. This just outright shatters it, because it explicitly says that every single thing that has happened in this universe was to facilitate the never-ending battle between the Shredder and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. See, if you look at this movie as a piece of meta-narrative dealing with different incarnations that are different at face value but similar in their core DNA, then it's great. It's a great way to celebrate the history of the brand, but if you look at it as a story that comes after the seven seasons I just analyzed, then the whole show is ruined. Nothing that happened here really mattered. This movie also raises questions a fan of the 2003 series might wonder that don't get answered. For example, why can't they just enlist the help of the Damio to send the 87 Turtles, the Shredder, Krang, and the Technodrome back using the War Staff? In a more serious example, 87 Shredder tries finding this dimension's Shredder and finds Chirrell on the asteroid. But does the computer care that Chirrell is taking the name from somebody else? I mean, it can't bring back the Demon Shredder because he is dead. It can't bring back Cyber Shredder because he's also dead. Karai quit being the Shredder, so Chirrell is as close as it gets. But this fact is never really brought up. In fact, Chirrell takes his identity as the Shredder super seriously. That they take the name of the Shredder. My name. In vain. 
But did anyone ever tell him that it was revealed he was a fake? From his perspective, season 3 was probably like two hours ago, but for the 2000s characters, it was years ago at this point. Did Karai bring him up to speed in the fact that Hun stopped working for the foot because Terrell was not human? Because he knows that they don't have a good working relationship anymore when Hun shows up mutated. And the last time he saw Hun was when he was plunging into an abyss with Leatherhead. How does Karai feel while helping her father achieve evil goals despite actively fighting against his cyber counterpart the last time we saw her? In fact, why didn't this digital backup of Terrell come into play when Karai was obsessed with getting revenge for him in Season 4? You know, whatever happened to Serling? Did they ever send him home to 2105? Those last two aren't really the fault of Turtles Forever, but I'm just saying there are questions raised by this movie that aren't focused on. When talking about Karai, we can turn to the extended cut for some answers. I haven't mentioned it thus far, but the version of Turtles Forever that aired in 2009 was an abridged TV cut, and a director's cut was released on the 4Kids website. When Viacom got the rights to the TMNT in 2009, they released a DVD for Turtles Forever in 2010 that was met with fan backlash because it only included the TV cut of the film, leaving the director's cut with 8 minutes of extra footage as something you'd have to track down online. This was the most depressing part of my conversation with Mr. Lopez, as he said, quote, Turtles Forever was our first HD production at 1080p. There was a plan to do a really nice Blu-ray version of the film with commentary from the team, etc., but Turtles got sold to Viacom, and they put out a less than desirable cut standard version that used old licensing art which was disappointing because I put so much time into doing the original movie poster for Turtles Forever." Unquote. This made me resent the DVD we got of the film more than I already did. The box screams lazy because this is, as he says, art from the early 2003 series, not the masterful poster he drew for free because they ran out of budget by the time he had to draw it. I would have loved a Blu-ray of this movie. I mean, look at the footage on the screen. That's me editing it to look full screen. The DVD couldn't be bothered with that, so it looks like this. Diabolically lazy, I say. But I was talking about the director's cut, so let's get back to that. It's in this cut of the film that you learn that Karai was tracking her father's location, and when he turned up in the Technodrome, that's why she was able to show up and rescue him. A lot of the stuff that was cut isn't super important, but if you've seen both, you know that the cuts made in the TV version are super awkward. Take this, for example. The Turtles see the damage the Utram Shredder is causing with the new Technodrome in their dimension, prompting 87 Mikey to say, Then maybe it's time we bust out two of our baddest rides! But the cut to this is so abrupt. Then maybe it's time we bust out two of our baddest rides! When you watch the extended cut, it's much more natural. Looks like the Technodrome got itself a makeover of the Utram kind. Then maybe it's time we- That goes for just about all the things cut out. Even if it's not super important, like a scene of Casey and April fighting Shredder's mutant army while the turtles are gone. In this example, they cut past a scene of the 87 turtles joking about their Shredder being decaf, and the laughing was fading out while 2003 Leo and Don started talking. Gotcha. <laughs> Up to speed now. What I want to know is... And in the cut version, you can hear this. When Shredder is back, doing what? To who? What I want to know is... However, Two scenes got cut that I think affected the film in a more negative way beyond awkward pacing. First, you have this scene in the lair that was awkwardly chopped up in the TV version. What was cut out was this bit where 2003 Raph starts saying the 87 Turtles are just clown idiots. But Splinter chimes in. And all are welcome here. Do not embarrass your sensei. This is later referenced when the 2003 Turtles meet the 87 Splinter. You four are welcome here, always. That's kind of what our Master Splinter said to us about them. But 2003 Splinter saying that was cut from the movie, so it doesn't make sense now. Last note on this. In the extended cut, there's a bit I really liked at the end. When Shredder's trying to kill the turtles by killing the Mirage Turtles, he realizes that it means killing all of them. Karai then pleads that she doesn't want to lose him again, and he actually stops to think about it before just resuming his plan. If I were him, why wouldn't he keep going? I mean, he just learned that his entire existence was in service of getting beaten by Ninja Turtles, so this is his only chance to actually win. This exchange between him and Karai was worth keeping in, if you ask me, but I see why they cut it for time. Karai could have used a lot more screen time in general. The extended cut shows how she came to the Technodrome, but if I was in charge of this movie, I would have had scenes where she and her father talk about her run as the Shredder. I mean... Would he be happy she did that or mad, as he claims that he's the only Shredder? But like I said, she doesn't get that much screen time here to flesh that out. Before I touch on the climax, I do want to say that I love the Utram Shredder in this movie. 
His various comebacks in seasons six and seven were really lame, but here he's so cool, just like in seasons one through four. He's got a big scheme here that he goes about achieving in clever ways, finally showing me what made the Shredder such a big deal. I say that because this was actually my first time ever seeing a Shredder. As I mentioned before, I didn't watch Season 7, so I missed out on Cyber Shredder, and my bits of TMNT exposure prior to this, fast forward in the 2007 movie, didn't have him in it. So when this movie came out and I got to the scene where 87 Shredder was geeking out over the Season 1 clips of the Utram Shredder, I was right there with him. There he is, and he is magnificent. What strength, what power! I had to bring up that nostalgic tidbit because I was still grinning from ear to ear whenever Terrell was on the screen in this movie. I really enjoyed his character in this one. Like I almost always do, he's a great villain. Now, anyway, around 55 minutes in, the third act begins as the eight turtles travel to the Mirage Dimension since the 2003 world was literally erased from existence. This is the best part of the movie by far. The first two acts might annoy you if you're a fan of the 80s show with the goofy characters, or it will irk you like it did me in its simplification of the 2003 series, but here, you can really just forget all that and enjoy the movie as a tribute to the brand with the 84 turtles appearing. The final act of this movie takes a dynamic from earlier where the 2000s turtles react to how goofy the 87 turtles are and flip it on its head by having the comic turtles look at all of them in the same light since they're the most serious TMNT group to ever exist. Making references like this. What's with the multicolored headband? Zello. <laughs> <laughs> It shows that serious storytelling is a spectrum and anything could look goofy compared to something that takes itself more seriously, while also poking fun of the narration you'd see in comic book panels. He's not alone. Why is he narrating? Is he crazy? If you look at the dynamic from earlier in the movie as a setup for this message, I think it works a lot better. There are a lot of elements in the finale I liked, such as Mirage Shredder appearing, but getting taken down in two seconds. Could be a reference to his dying in the first issue of the comics. I like this bit. I will not stop until... Oh! Less talk, more action. And this really goofy part. <laughs> but the best part was when they find out that the Shredder's only weakness is the laser coming from the Technodrome. And while he's getting hurt by it, Bebop and Rocksteady accidentally trip over the plug powering the beam, bringing Shredder back into the fight. But then they think they screwed up, so they make sure to plug it back in, only to defeat the Shredder. The Master will be pleased. I will... Perfectly in line for all the characters there. But beyond that, there isn't really much left to the story. The 87 characters return home via the Technodrome as they say goodbye to the 2003 cast. It's ninja time! Turtle power! A scene that would also be the last time we'd see the 2000s Turtles. I'm gonna miss those punch balls. Not. And in the film on an homage to the original comic that was published 25 years ago at this point. Like I said in the Back to the Sewer video, the team behind this show always cared about it and the fans. Something you feel while listening to the credits is they play an unused theme of the 2003 series that was pitched before they settled on the final one and then playing instrumentals of Fast Forward, Back to the Sewer, and finally the 2003 series theme. I bring this up because it's one of the last hits of nostalgia for this era of Turtles. As I said, this was the end. It wasn't created to be the end, but serves that purpose. One of my favorite quotes related to Turtles Forever was when a fan named Rutger did an interview with Sam Regal, the voice of Donatello, asking him what his favorite moment from his era of TMNT was, and he said it was Comic-Con 2009, when they aired a rough cut of the movie to all the fans present who were going nuts over the references and cool moments. I bring this seemingly random point up because of the fact that the effort to bring the fans something they love was there from 2003 all the way to 2009. I might not love the last two seasons. I think Turtles Forever has its problems, but all in all, it's a loving tribute to the history of the TMNT. Something that has made many people, including me, very happy over the years. The problems that the last seasons have and this movie had were simply out of the creative's hands mostly but the product we got was still a lot of fun at the end of the day, and if that's there, how much complaining can I really do? I began this video series on a history of the Turtles that led to the 2003 series, and now that we're at the end of the road, I'll talk about the aftermath. In late 2009, we got Turtles Forever, of course, in the video game TMNT Smash Up, a game with TMNT 2007's art style, but used the 2003 voice cast, the last game to do so, which will be important in a moment, I swear. 
The big announcement that came in late 2009 was that Nickelodeon had acquired the rights to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from Mirage Studios. They inherited the rights to the 2003 series, however, they didn't have any intentions of continuing it. Instead, the brand took a few years off as they worked on conceptualization of a new 3D animated series targeting a new generation of fans that would debut in 2012. This did indeed premiere in 2012, becoming very popular very quickly. This show being much more up the alley of 80s Turtles fans than the 2003 series ever was, even getting to do a more faithful bring back of those original Turtles than the 2003 series did. In the 2010s, the TMNT saw releases in other mediums, of course. Playmate still did the figures, different companies handling the rights to do video games, Michael Bay producing a duology of Ninja Turtles movies that debuted in 2014 and 2016, respectively, as the 2012 TMNT series came to a close in 2017. A new TMNT series taking its place in 2018. The TMNT effect I mentioned in the last video took place in the 2010s as well, with Rise of the TMNT's second season ending in 2020. Honestly, I didn't know it lasted that long. I never really heard much of it past the different and therefore ruined crowd complaining about it being different and therefore ruined. But now, it seems we're getting a new TMNT film in 2023, and here's hoping that turns out great and starts up a new generation of Turtles fans, as seems to be the case every decade for the last almost 40 years. Having said all that, I think the 2003 series is in an interesting spot. When the 2012 show was coming out, this was when the fan base was in its peak, which cartoon is better war? back when we only had two. A lot of fans really didn't like the 2003 series, which was what I've been saying since my video on Season 2. Going into the new decade, it seemed like this era of Turtles was being left behind. What I find so fascinating about the 2003 series is the thing that made me want to do this retrospective in the first place. In the 2010s, the Turtles, despite their new content, became one of those brands that had the nostalgia for its heyday be one of the most significant traits about it. Walk into a store and most TMNT merch found now are paying homage to the 87 series, but back in the 2000s, it was a much different story. I didn't mean it lightly that the 2003 series was meant to be a modern day reboot that would become the face of the brand going forward. The show was the main attraction, all the merch was based on it, the games were based on it, even the retro TMNT games included in said games used the voice samples from the 2003 Turtles. Cowabunga! It was a modern-day reboot that is also trapped in the past, while the version it was rebooting has come back in full force. So that's why I say I made this retrospective the way I did. I wanted to document everything that contributed towards their effort of bringing back the Turtles from its spot in the late 90s through the show, the merchandise, the DVDs, all that, and then talk about how the 2003 series gradually fell off its own wagon, how the cycle started anew again in 2012, where we are today, and why I feel like the 2003 Turtles will return because time has seemingly healed all wounds. Concepts from the 2003 series would return, like Agent Bishop and Darius Dunn appearing in the IDW comics that began in the early 2010s. Characters such as Agent Bishop and Hun would be adapted for the 2012 show, Rise of the TMNT even taking inspiration from the 2003 series' fifth season for its Tangu theme Shredder. Nick would periodically do reruns of the 2003 series starting in 2014, releasing more lame DVDs in 2015, and put in the entire show, minus Turtles Forever, on Paramount Plus in 2020. My point is, the 2003 series have been paid homage to in small bits and pieces here and there, which leads me to the belief that one day it may make a comeback. Whether that be a follow-up comic or a Turtles Forever type reunion, I don't know, but I think it's certainly possible. I guarantee, 2003 series themed NECA toys collectibles have got to be on their way. It's been Mirage Comics, 87 series, and now 90s movie Turtles stuff for the last 13 years or so. The next big incarnation to tackle is the 2003 series, right on time for it turning 20 years old next year. But with that said, it's time to wrap this up. I cannot thank you guys enough for watching this video series. To say that it went past my expectations would be quite the understatement. I went into this wanting to do something I cared about, expecting it to get the same views I got on Star Wars or Ratchet and Clank last year, i.e. low views. But here, we now have another topic to add to my list of heavily requested subject matters and I can't be happier to say. Of course, people have been asking me about what's next for weeks now, and I'll answer that question here and now. I am beyond stoked that TMNT fans are with me now, and there are plenty of videos I could do. A more in-depth look at the video games, a series in the 87 show, the movies, the 2012 series is a big request, but this does lead to a supply problem. The 2003 Turtles are my Turtles. I have been thinking about these points you've been hearing for years now. I've never fully seen the entire classic show, I've never watched the 2012 series past its first season, so 
So I'd have to do a lot of research to do a series as good as this one on those shows. It's not that I can't do it, it's just that it would be different. Also, I just did eight straight videos on TMNT, so I think it's time to give it a rest for a little while. But rest assured, I do plan on talking about TMNT again someday, and I hope you'll all join me for that. In the meantime, if you like 2000s nostalgia, superheroes, 25-year-old video games, and other geekdom subjects, stick around, because a lot of exciting stuff is coming in the year 2022 on Jay's Reviews. To close, I'll just say the same thing I always do. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you next time.